Hello, and thank you for joining us for our Wednesday chat. I'm in the book of Revelation on chapter 8. In fact, the section from chapter 8, 1 through 11, 18 again brings us to the end. And this chapter and the next are very reminiscent of the plagues of Egypt. I think you'll notice that. The purpose of those plagues was to change Pharaoh's mind, that he might repent and let God's people go. If he did not repent, which he didn't, judgment would fall, which it did. In the book of Revelation, most don't repent. Seven trumpets, seven seals. Four trumpets are coming up in this chapter, separated by three woes, just like the four horsemen separated the last seals. The first four trumpet judgments impact the natural world, and the last three are pointed toward unbelievers. As bad as those first four are, it gets worse. Verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. So we finally get the seventh seal, but there's no judgment, just silence. So silence could be the seventh seal, or some argue that the seven trumpets are contained within the seven seals. It says there was silence in heaven for half an hour. A half an hour could mean specifically 30 exact literal minutes or a short time. The silence was awesome. The calm before the storm. The eye of the hurricane. Brooding apprehension. Someone said all heaven waits with awestruck wonder. Heaven has been very noisy up to this point in time with praise. But it's as if God commands silence so he can hear the prayers of the saints. Verse 2, and I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. The seven angels, they seem to be distinguished from other angels. In fact, tradition says there are seven archangels who are well known. Michael, Gabriel, Uriel, Raphael, Raguel, Remiel, and Sariel. And they're given trumpets which are used to summon to battle. God is about to move in a strong way, and it's certainly a warning to repent. Verse 3, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. This is probably alluding to the altar of incense in the ancient tabernacle and temple. Trumpets would be blown in the temple after the priests offered incense. The altar of incense was made of gold, 18 inches square by 3 foot high. Each corner had horns with a rail around it. Incense seasons the prayers. They smell good to God. The prayers are for God to judge. The prayers are a sacrifice to God and he hears them. Verse 4, the smoke of the incense, together with the prayers of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. The incense and prayers were a sweet fragrance to God. He judges in response to the prayers. Verse 5, then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So he took the coals from the incense altar with those prayers and threw them to the earth. That's very graphic and symbolic. The cries of the saints bring judgment on the wicked. Their prayers went quietly up to heaven, but returned to earth with intense noise and force. The earth was shaken by their prayers. Verse 6, then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Verse 7, the first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it was hurled down to the earth. Some kind of violent cosmic storm, very reminiscent of the seventh Egyptian plague. You can look up Exodus 9, 22 to 24 to see the reference. Was it supernatural or was it natural? Probably natural because the earth is affected. In the second trumpet, the sea is affected, so salt bodies of water 
the third trumpet the rivers, the fresh water, and the fourth the skies. All creation groans. A third of the earth was burned up. A third of the trees were burned up. And all the green grass was burned up. Just witnessing that fire in Hawaii, it's just very clear what a judgment that this really is. The crops, the grass, the trees are destroyed a third. That's a lot. Yet still the idea is it's limited. It isn't everything. It isn't over yet. Not total destruction from the fire. Verse 8. The second angel sounded his trumpet, and something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea turned into blood. John is trying hard to describe what he sees, something like a mountain. Again, is this supernatural or natural? Is, is it a meteor or an asteroid hitting the, earth, hitting the sea? There's a lot of prophecies about a great asteroid that hits the Atlantic Ocean. A third of the sea turns to blood, corresponding with the first Egyptian plague where the Nile turned to blood. Is it blood from all the dead fish caused from this mountain, blazing mountain that hits the sea? Verse 9, a third of the living creatures in the sea died and a third of the ships were destroyed. The fishing industry is ruined and the commercial flow of goods and oil are destroyed. Verse 10, the third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star, blazing like a torch, fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. Uh, again, is this a natural phenomenon, this star, some kind of meteor or asteroid, or is it missiles, a nuclear bomb perhaps? The rivers are full of fresh water is impacted by this. Verse 11, the name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had become bitter. Wormwood is an actual plant, sometimes poisonous. It's a bitter herb. It made the drinking supply bad of the fresh water. Here's an interesting side note. In the Ukrainian language, the word wormwood is translated Chernobyl. And we all know about the Chernobyl nuclear disaster. So I wonder, could this be nuclear? Verse 12, the fourth angel sounded his trumpet and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light and also a third of the night. So some kind of an eclipse in the heavens. The ninth Egyptian plague in Exodus 10, 21 to 23 is a corollary passage. Could this be nuclear winter? Dust blocks sunlight. If an asteroid or meteor hit the earth, it would have the same effect. Or is it like in Egypt, just a supernatural darkness, this plague on the earth? Verse 13, as I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair. Now, some older translations had the word angel, but eagle is the proper translation there, in mid-heaven, so all could see. Eagles were on the Roman soldiers' poles. Again, I think a symbol of judgment. The eagle is the messenger of upcoming judgment. He called out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blasts about to be sounded by the other three angels. Well, eagles don't usually talk, but this one does. And he warns the earth dwellers of coming woes. Three means intensity, really bad, but there's still time to repent. I think the world really begs to see a Christian really living out their faith. And... <laughs> I know there is a very solid reference that makes a difference for us to do that. And it is that Jesus decided to take on the personhood we have upon himself. He put it on. So every move he made, every step he took, created something in our sight to celebrate and embrace for ourselves. 
bodies like ours never knew the potential in them until he inhabited them. Never the same. So to capture the excellence is to see the hints and glints of the shining fullness from him as he did it. Grace and truth that comes out at every seam. Such glimpses wait to be found of us. When we discover this about Jesus, it never disappoints. It always breaks us into loving. This personhood. So when I say something about myself, I or me, means one thing. What does it mean when Jesus, the eternal God, says, I? How does he feel about his own identity to hear his own lips say, I myself? What can we, can we learn for ourselves from him? A great gain is available in this time when there's such a lack of assurance among us. I remember a college friend, and I'll say her name was Kathy, said, I am comfortable in Christ. I'm just not comfortable in Kathy. Can you relate? The Trinity was from the beginning. So God, Yahweh, in the Old Testament said, I myself at different times. So personal, so much personality right there. On one hand, he said, I myself will fight against you. Almost like Revelation, with outstretched hand and strong arm. Then about praise, I will show my greatness and my holiness and make myself known in the eyes of my nations many nations then they will know i am the lord then now i will arise says the lord now i will lift myself up now i will be exalted i will provide water to drink for my people whom i formed for myself so they might praise me so this is a true enough picture to speak about god that we could say behold your god of what we just said but there is a benevolence for his people that he also expresses. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. And just so you could listen to all the me's and the eyes of this. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he. And to gray hairs, I will carry, I have made, and I will bear. I will carry and will save. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Seeking his sheep, behold, by myself I will search for my sheep and I will seek them out. And this is like a transition into the shepherd of the New Testament who would say, and I... When I have lived am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Then in John 14, 21, both with the Father and the Son, saying, I, whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. He says later, if I, or earlier, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, to be with me where I am, that you may be also. So Jesus, speaking like I myself, as a shepherd, he knew the former magnification of the true God in the Old Testament. He was fully praiseworthy of being magnified among the nations, just as his father had been. With the Trinity, he knew better than us that it would be the best thing for us humans to know and acknowledge and partake of him for who he was, the fullness of God in bodily form, like personhood. So what does Jesus do with all this coming into a mere jar of clay, like the incarnation? With all on the line, how does Jesus express himself? Personhood would be born grow in stature, need sustenance and eating and sleeping, meaning he got tired, and experience emotions. Again, at any and every step, the truth was seen in him. In all this power under control, we see such virtuous self-restraint, 
a crown of self-denial. When cut to the core or moved to frustration or between a rock and a hard place, the true product always remained constant. He was not here to seek his own glory. Few passages, I am not possessed by a demon, as he was accused, said Jesus, but I honor my father, and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it, and he is judge. Again, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. Again, I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. Another, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true, and in him there is no falsehood. I feel like we could stop right there. This is personhood at its very best. We see inside Jesus only sought the glory of the one who sought him. No falsehood, pure upon pure. I see a reflection of that as he taught the disciples and us the Lord's Prayer, Thy Kingdom Come. Well, that had always been a messianic expectation of the, an ideal king, the ideal king, to speak of the kingdom. And in the hearers Jesus was speaking to, they considered that no prayer was considered a prayer unless you mentioned the kingdom and the kingdom of Messiah. So here, the true teacher of the prayer, Lord's Prayer, did not even include kingdom of Messiah, though he himself knew he was the head of that kingdom. So what is he revealing to us through words he says and does not say about himself? He is fully worthy of worship. It opens to us what could be contained in us who naturally want to climb higher than we ought in others' estimation, our need for credit, validation, applause, and sometimes at the least we want justice. Well, what about Jesus and justice in his personhood? He did not seek to exalt or vindicate himself. God the Father did and God the Father would. He could commit himself to this. God will take care of him, the one who seeks my glory, resting upon the Father who seeks it and judges between him and those doubting it. Jesus was always about the Father for seeking his honor, not trying to get praise for himself. He was convinced of sincerity and truth. He knew wisdom was justified of her children, and he was fully committed to the one who judges justly. So... When they hurled insults at him, he didn't retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly, 1 Peter 2.23. He doesn't need to, and maybe he doesn't even want to justify himself. Do we feel this much support, advocacy like this? With this forming his identity, I myself, like said about the wounds and getting to know that, what does he want for I myself? I think he wants the one who comes in his honor, the one who would come himself in his honor and seeks his glory. So is this life Jesus gave a viable way for us? I went through something so hard yesterday, I feel like I can say yes, it is. Benefit and operate in the personhood like him. The lack of fear or defending self and self-promotion. The Trinity, in this case, was able to complete their operation since he was not seeking his own glory. Certainly, we see the excellence of his personhood in Gethsemane. The pulse in him pushed to its limits. The intensity of being a human clamoring. I have come to bring fire on the earth and, oh, how I wish it were already kindled. A fire to kindle and he was hard pressed. The pressure until it was. How I wish. Can't we feel his insides? Not my will. I have a will. I have a right. I have authority to call rescuing angels. But I take that and with all honor I surrender it to total cost to myself because of loving the Father. So this is the height we know that there is disruption, mutation, distortion of that glory. 
of us in the flesh, created in his image, the one who would seek his own glory can't achieve this shining. It's the opposite. It's the degradation of shining. And I feel like Paul really describes one. He says, who opposes his own self. In 2 Timothy 2.25, seems like Jesus saying to Saul, oh, how hard it is to kick against the goads when he was persecuting Jesus and his people. This person is the, uh, is the opponent, but they oppose themselves. They contradict themselves. They set themselves uh, uh, to oppose the tenets of God, as Paul said, that they may come to their senses, maybe, and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured to do his will. It says that right now their state is away from their senses, in the devil's snare, captured to do his will, who we know sadly wants to destroy all image bearers against and imposing themselves in their own person. And then I compared this with this lovely thought in Ephesians 5, 28. He who loves his wife loves himself. He promotes her on the same welfare as when he cares for his own body. She then imports happiness to him. Promote his own happiness, every man who loves himself, his own bride, his own self. The wife belongs essentially to the proper self of the husband, like Jesus with the father, like the bride to Christ. The wife is part of the self as the body. So love is not like a duty, but it's by nature. So we're not opposing ourselves. We're going with nature. To oppose that is striving against nature, against the law. Maybe as that first passage of Yahweh in the Old Testament, where God is going to fight against. So here is Jesus' personhood. He deserved exaltation. He did not try to gain glory. He so knew himself. We can now be resourced in that personhood. Like Jesus said, I set myself apart for their sake. Myself, again he's saying, for their sake I consecrate myself that they may also be sanctified in truth. Selfless, like Jesus, we can be resourced by the one who seeks it for us. What a stability of solid self-identity as we show ourselves to the world that is always seeing how we're handling things. To live out our personhood. We live for what it does in us. Jesus set apart, we are like him. It's a soil and strong place now to gain stability for what he did when given flesh like ours how we stand and reveal being persons so i'm you know we're going to be facing something in the next two days some local people know and it's something that um right before bed happened that really put this all over the top of an already difficult situation and almost as soon as that thought came it was to reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ. And I thought about that phrase. It couldn't be a man if he didn't take on a body. If he didn't come into a body like ours, we couldn't reign with that one man. What a privilege to take even the most odd circumstances. And because he became, and I guess I'll just add one more thought. I thought if nothing more than my life was one big problem, nothing more. He would have encased this problem with flesh and the fact he took it on, I could reign in life through him who took this on with me. Yes, let's pray. Jesus, you came. We are so glad for that. You became one of us, took on a human body. You know all that we're going through. Folks that are out there today that are going through really mm -hmm. big problems, just let them be encouraged today that you are with them, you understand, you care, and you will come and help them. In Jesus' name, amen.